Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. You know, the, the, mo the singular most important thing to me is this. The singular most important thing to me is to be able to see the church of the Lord Jesus Christ be what the Bible describes, be what God describes. I know Father has a desire. You know, we, we say, you know, hopefully with great passion, Father, your will be done. We, we say with hopefully great passion, Lord Jesus, we're living for your glory. We say to him, we say, we love you. And when we begin to talk to the Father about loving him and we talk to the Lord Jesus about loving him, if there's anything that we want to do in the context of loving him, it's honoring him, you know, and it's bringing the, the, the glory that is due to his name. And I understand something very fundamental about whether or not the power of the Holy Ghost is going to fall upon a church or fall upon a family. The offering's got to be right. And, you know, the beautiful thing about the Lord is he's made it to where through the blood of Jesus Christ, the offering is right. But if the attitudes and the hearts of people go, go south and there is not a submission and a yieldedness to the Lord Jesus, there's not a submission and a yieldedness to his ways, the offering's now blemished. Fire God's not going to fall on that. Till somebody repents, repenting is so easy. Now, let me tell you something. Our, our culture and our society believes things that uh, are very different from God's standard. I'm going to tell you, God, heaven, what is more valuable in reality than what our culture has placed on, on mankind, on us, God values virtue, not intellect. We value intellect, not virtue. Not, I mean, really, on a skill. It's about how smart you are. That's how you're going to get ahead. It's about how smart you are, how much money you're going to make, how much you ultimately, you know, do whatever you got to do to succeed. It's not with God. Father honors meekness and humility. That's, that's what's most valuable to him. He said, that's why a woman who has a meek and a quiet spirit is of great value to the Lord. Father honors the things of mercy and patience. These are, these are much more important uh, characteristics and attributes than what our society places on us as far as individuals go. And so we tend to go with whatever our culture uh, dictates and whatever pressures of society are on us. And, and I, I, I really want to try to help you tonight to realize, first and foremost, the wrong influences that you are under. The adversity that wars against you. And there's absolutely no way to even get a clue as to what I'm saying until you step into the light of His presence. When you step into the light of His presence, when you begin to be overwhelmed, with those things which only the Holy Ghost can make known and reveal, reveal to you. You look back and you'll go, my, I had no idea I lived under such influences. I had no idea my attitudes and my dispositions and the way I process and the way I thought, and that's what we wanted to be, was so under the influence of a worldly system in which the God of this world the spirit of disobedience saturates the atmosphere. I know that if we're going to have a church that is going to be everything that God has intended it to be, filled with His glory, filled with everything that is, that, that is a, a dimension of heaven on earth, that is an expression of the person of the Lord Jesus, in, the, in, in well, the fullness of God, then first and foremost, families have got to be right. Things have got to be in order in our house. God's got a divine order. God created all of this. He created the relationships. He defines the relationships. As much as God created you and me, He created the relationship in every context of relationship. He created every authority, every principality, every power, every dimension of interaction that goes on. And if we could understand that, perhaps then we're going to be uh, 
We're going we're to listen more. We're going to be more mindful and considerate that these things are sacred. They're not open for debate. And, and I'm going to take you through some pretty challenging things here tonight. So I'm trying to get you set up. I'm going to talk to you about something that is so glorious it's totally misunderstood. I'm going to talk to you about the relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, that, it, that, that words just fail to really communicate what this really is and what it's supposed to be. And so, therefore, the Lord models it for us with respect to His relationship with the Father, uh, the man's relationship with Him, what it's supposed to be, but more than that, what the church relationship is supposed to be. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, man, I, I, you know, this subject is so intense to me. The, the issues concerning everything that Satan is doing to try to stop this from going forth, from being received and understood, the magnitude of it, most people will never even begin to appreciate until they get to heaven. Because this stuff... The things that I'm talking to you about, Father's will, about right relationships, about divine order, Satan is singularly focused on stopping it. And, you know, I, I love to just be, you know, sweet and mild and happy and, and, and deliver things that way. But the bottom line of it is, is I'm literally at war. I am literally coming up against so much opposition to be able to deliver these kinds of things in such a way where people will hear it. And then, oh, uh, I mean, the next step, no, we, we pray in Jesus' name, they obey and hearken to it. So I'm talking to you about something that is, that it, it, in, for the most part, it's wrong in most people's relationship right off the bat. Understand, the relationship that goes down between a husband and wife, in most instances, it's wrong because it's being modeled after the culture of this world and religious ideas and principles. If there's anything we want to see uh, it, it, greater than that moving of God in the midst of the house, is the moving of God in his church. But for that to happen, there's got to be a moving of God's divine order in the house. And we have to also understand that there's more than just the man and the woman here that's being affected, the husband and the wife, because God's given us the ability in the context of this relationship to create eternal souls. And I don't know that we grasp that. I don't know that we really grasp that because it's been so reduced to something so ordinary, so common, that people right now are excited about uh, stem cell research from which you have to basically sacrifice and create artificial embryos, human beings, to have the means by which to gain this research tool. I'm telling you, dear people, we are in a devastating society and we praise that. And we revel in it and we glorify it. And what we don't understand is the same in influences that have resulted in that kind of outcome are at war against you and me right now. They're touching our lives right now in various different levels. And if we can begin to come into the presence of the Lord, if we can begin to stand in His presence, continually be filled with the Spirit, longing for the things that He desires to teach us to be unveiled in our life. All of this will become clear. You'll understand why the preacher is saying, no more will we give place to rebellion. No more will we be present ourselves before the Lord in such a way, in such a manner that's displeasing to Him and 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 doesn't look like his description. We ultimate that, 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 that which he describes in his word that we're supposed to be. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you really hard here with with something, and and I'm gonna hit you hard with it because I want to shock you just a little bit. Okay, and tonight you know first night we talked about really the woman's submission uh, to her husband, and this is all in the context of those who are walking with Christ Jesus, filled with the Spirit. And, um, you know, someone said, well, submission just means to respect. Well, it actually means more than respect, because so I'm going to give to you, those of you who are scholars, it is hupotasate 
inasmuch as she phobetie, her husband, calling him kurion. In other words, what I just said, she submits it so much that she fears her husband calling him Lord. Now, those verses of Scripture are Ephesians 5.22. Ephesians 5.33, see that the woman reverence her husband right there at the end. It is from the, it's from the Greek word uh, phobiete, and, uh, which, from which we derive phobia or fear. And um, calling him kurion, or kurios, which is to say Lord, the same word we use to describe the Lord Jesus, calling him Lord. And um, that, of course, then found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. And so, you know, I'm, I want to hit you real hard with that. And, you know, of course, let me just say this. You know, I, I would not be comfortable with my wife calling me Lord. And, and so somebody said, well, the Bible says you should call you Lord. Well, 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 well I would rather her treat me that way rather than call me that. Huh? I'm much more comfortable with her treating me that way. And so I, I'm, I'm just going to encourage all of you to recognize that there is a relationship going on here that's not something that is in the context of any earthly or worldly model. Because the Lord is calling husbands to rule their house and, 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 and he's calling husbands to have this authority uh, in the relationship of a husband and a wife context. Um. In view of a governorship of love, ruling with love. And that, that's very, very different from any other idea of submission. Because it's, you know, we immediately think something about that we're trying to say, well, the, the, that, you know, the woman is inferior to the man. We're not talking about inferiority. But see, that's the context that you're going to get from a a worldly model. And of course, feminism is rising up with such intensity. Now, of course, you know, that is, of course, probably the, the first biggest wave against divine order, the order of God's relationship that he created between a man and a woman. But now, because we have vi exalted the vilest of men and we've asked them to rule over us, now we're in a situation here where homosexuality, the marriage between the same sex, <laughs> is put forth as equal to the divine order of God. And there it could be nothing uh, that Satan could do more in his rebellion and in his terror against God and against his ways to defile God's divine order than that. Now, let me just say this. You can be in awe, you know, and, 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 and really appreciate how bad, how vile, what, what of a bad violation it is for uh, someone to come along and say that the marriage between two people of the same sex is equal to the marriage of a man and a woman. You can say, what an offense and violation against divine order, couldn't you? A whole lot more are going on that you're accepting and you realize. And that's what I want to try to communicate to you. You know, we would just, I would just love for you, I'd love to be able to grab a hold of you and take you and put you and show you what I see and what I know and what God has unveiled to me and what I feel and what I experience and what I live. There's nobody around here see me mistreating my wife. I honor her. I love her. She's my very best friend. I'll do anything for her. i lay down my life for her. I, if someone, someone tried to hurt her in any way, I'm telling you right now, huh? I have a jealous, protective love. I'll give her everything that I have. Everything that I have is hers. There is no begrudging it. There is no, I love to do it. I, there is the model of love that we see in what Christ Jesus did. I'm going to say something to you tonight that's going to shock you. I'm going to help you understand that, 
that what God has placed in his divine order is so wonderful and so beautiful and we've got to be able to appreciate it, but we can't appreciate it until we're able and willing to move past all of the demonic influences that have saturated our culture, our religious circles, and that we have become ourselves in agreement with to some, you know, some degree. We're in agreement with it. And when we, begin to, when we begin to slice at this thing and we begin to talk about women being, uh, wives being submission to their husband, uh, people grapple for what's going on here. What on earth is he saying? What, what's, what's taking place in, this, in this, this, this relationship concept? My, what does a guy walk around like a tyrant ruling his wife? He's got nobody else to rule, so he's constantly demanding things of her. You know, you can't even, you can't even begin to deal with the concept of this relationship outside of the context of first appreciating um, what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, what he did for his church, and who he is to his church right now. My computer's acted just fine all day, and I'm having, it's, it's breaking down on me right now. For, for the, the reasons that I know. And, you know, I, I so appreciate all of you being here. I just hope that you can understand the challenge that, that I am facing in communicating these things that will radically change your life if you will hear them and do them. I want you to appreciate the challenge that you're having being able to even hear them. Because this isn't just information. This isn't just you know, some concepts to consider. I'm laying out for you the divine order of God, what Father created. I want to show you tonight here, and for example, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want, you to, I want to just remind you here of a few verses of Scripture. Of course, this is in, also in context to Ephesians chapter 5, um, verses 23 through 33, but let me go ahead and read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 to you tonight. And uh, I'll just go ahead and, and start off, and I could read it to you in Greek if that would help, but I know it wouldn't help because you wouldn't understand it. It would be Greek to you, but, you know. Maybe Manuel will understand, but the rest of you wouldn't. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And I would have you know that the head of every woman is a man. And I have you to know that the head of every, the head of Christ is God. What are we talking about? We're talking about leadership. Huh? And, and we can't, and, and if you really want to understand how that a man is supposed to be the leader of the wife, you're going to have to look at how Father's the leader of the Lord Jesus. You're going to have to understand that dynamic of relationship. You're going to have to understand the model of how the Lord Jesus is the leader of the man. And what that model is supposed to look like, because I'm not sure that that model is very clear to folks. And, and so, in, in, in many respects, I think it's easier for people to understand it from the perspective of Ephesians chapter 5 of the model of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church and what Jesus is to the church and how the church is supposed to respond to his leadership and what the dynamics of that interaction ought to be. And that's really what ought to be going on in respect to a husband and his wife. And in, in view of that, the wife is going to be in submissions. She's going to be under her husband, following his leadership, being willing to understand the model that the Lord set up, <laughs> that I'm getting ready to read to you here in these next few verses of Scripture, that the woman is ultimately created in God to draw all of her identity and all of her purpose out of the man even as the church is to draw all of his identity and purpose out of Christ. The model is, is un, un, unimpeachable. In every dimension in which you evaluate it, the model is exact. And if we're ever going to get what God has for us, we're going to come into his divine order. I've asked the Lord, I, I, the other night I was just, you know, just broken before God, and I said, Lord, how many people are even going to make heaven? 
Father, it's so few people even understand the passion of, of your will and purpose, the separation between your realm and the realms of this world. How many people are even going to make heaven? How many people really want you to rule over them? I mean, to rule with absolute authority where there's no moving outside, uh, not a single degree from the perspective of his will. And that's not tyrannic. That's not a, a, tyrannical. It's not a reign of tyranny. It's not a reign of control. It's this beautiful realm of divine love and relationship where the Lord calls us and gives us an opportunity that we, that we can't even begin to imagine because in this opportunity, He vests in us everything that He has. He freely gives us all His glory. And here we are in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> in verse 7, it says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he's the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. The woman never receives or understands who she is, never steps into her rightful place until she finds the right relationship with her husband. The woman was created from the man, not the man from the woman. God looked at Adam in Genesis chapter 2. He looked at a situation of Adam being in need of someone to fulfill him and complete him. And the woman ultimately completes the man as much as she completes creation. But women aren't willing to do it because of a satanic assignment, a strategy that Satan has leveled against the family to be able to destroy the church, to ultimately erase any remembrance and fear of God and moving of God from off the face of the earth. It's true. And we're moving towards it faster than the majority realizes most people do not know how we are already, already in the apostasy on many levels. I have, I have friends, more mature friends in ministry and whatnot. They get it. They know it. They're preaching it. Uh, but they, they aren't really being heard in the intensity of it. They're saying things like people don't realize we're at the midnight hour. They don't realize that time's run out. They don't understand the moment of time and the critical nature of this environment in which we are in right now. The church is in peril. And there are few that are aware of it. We all on vacation. We sleep in. And when I'm talking about this message of order in the house, it is the very, it isn't just a, you know, one of those major uh, you know, <laughs> messages and, and topics that we need to discuss. It's at the very heart of the issue because God's first vehicle and means by which He advanced His will in the earth was through the family, through an Abraham and a Sarah. And Abraham and his Sarah had a, had a great relationship. And the result of that relationship was a very obedient son. Isaac, who being about 30 years of age, submitted to his dad for his dad to go offer him up on an altar to sacrifice him. Today, school teachers say, oh, you got to find your own self. you got to find your own person. You shouldn't be obeying your parents. You shouldn't let them live vicariously through you. And all the other things that are coming right out of the intercession of Satan. And few people recognize it. God's, I mean, people, people have, have, have reproached me and spoken evil against me because my sons obey me so perfectly. Ah, oh, look at him, men. He's controlling his sons. Wonder what he did to them. And, but on the other hand, you say, you're, give your kids a rebellious, you know. It's, well, there's another problem. No, it's just, I think it's easier to go. I heard one preacher say, I'd rather have a rebellious son than a, than a son who, uh, what was the word that he used? Who idolized me. <laughs> That's right out of hell. That's right out of hell. Because he was actually talking about me in his quote. He's saying that my sons idolize me. My sons honor me. My sons honor me because my wife honors me. My sons honor me because they see that I've given everything and I love, to my wife. I love her. And she's, she's so important to me. She's, she's, 
We won. There, there's not a separation. I, I mean, a, a man that walks in God loves his wife as his own body. <laughs> he, 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 there, there's no thought of going out and committing adultery. There's no thought of fornication. I love her as I love my own body. She's the most important thing to me. It's like God said, I'm going to take this notion of divine love and glory and all that I have that would take you, maybe, I'm just going to hypothesize on this, okay? Maybe that would take you uh, billions of years to understand and I'm going to put it into the limitation of you coming to know this kind of love through caring for one another in the context of a divine order between a husband and his wife. And so God caused a deep sleep, Genesis chapter 2, to fall upon Adam. And he opened him up and from his bone, his rib, short rib, from the blood of Adam, he created the woman. See, God created the man in his own image, in his own likeness. So we read the next verse of Scripture where it says, For man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. We see that what the Lord did was he took man, created him, gave him his own place and position and image. And out of that, to live out a divine purpose in a relationship with him. And from him he created a woman to ultimately, as it were, have the same kind of relationship going on between them as was going on between and is going on between him and the man. Now, there's a lot of things here that you're trying to find a place to file. You're trying to find a place to file the ideas. You're trying to keep up with the logic. What you got to do is you got to get into the beauty of the relationship. You got to get into the splendor of what's going on between the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to understand what I'm talking about. And the only way you can really begin to get into that and really touch that, you can't really touch it from an intellectual realm. You can only touch it because you begin to interact with Him by the Spirit of grace that has been given to us. You begin to enjoy that relationship with Him that causes you to live in purity and and in holiness and such obedience to where you say, Oh God, come rule over me. <laughs> My wife made me the king of the world. She made me the king of her world. Huh? Why? She's so full of Jesus. That's why. You wouldn't even be able to do that unless you're full of Jesus. She's so full of Jesus. She so not doesn't like the world. You could say she actually hates the world. She, you could say that she actually has no kinsmanship at all with the world. There's nothing about the world that has ever been in her life. Ever. I mean, she would go to Mass when she was 12 years old. And she, she would show up, you know. She's just, a, she's just a holy girl. She'd show up with nothing, no, no sins to confess so she'd make some up so she could go to confession. She'd just figure out something that she could say and then have to go ahead and confess for lying for making something up she didn't do. Because she just wanted to be there. She, you know, she wanted to be in the church. Then when she was born again, when she heard you could be born again when she was 18 years old, she went all the way. And when she went all the way with him, he went all the way with her and filled her up with something that's far more valuable than intellectual knowledge. F has far more riches than all the wealth of the world. Filled her up with love. We value intellect. Oh, my, oh, my uh, son or daughter or my husband or wife, really smart, really bright. Yeah, but they ornery too. They're very, very ornery. Oh, oh, my goodness, they got all these skills. Yeah, but they never, they never really... Uh, Shout and dance and leap and rejoice over the Lord. I mean, we've, we've valued things in a worldly system that have no value whatsoever in the kingdom of God. Did you know that a dollar bill has no value in the kingdom of God? Did you know that? Not a single dollar. But do you know how much value it has to you and to me in the world? Well, it doesn't really have it to me. I have no attachment to money. Money is a tool. We need it by this place. huh? But I mean, I'm, I, I have in my relationship with the Lord all the time. Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll say whatever you want me to say. Whatever price I have to pay, 
I'm willing to pay it. Huh? Because I love him. Oh, that's why my wife treats me like that, too, because she loves me. And it's not, a, it's not just an earthly human love. It's a divine love. Hallelujah. It's a divine, glorious, divine, holy ghost love. And it's the most beautiful, wonderful thing. I mean, I told my wife, I said, baby, you make so much, much, so much better decisions than I make in the natural. I'm just going to turn things over to you. Yeah, honey, but listen, God gave you the special gift and the anointing to lead us. So we'll laugh about it, but the Lord gave you special anointing to lead us. Because that's what he did. God gave the man as the leader an anointing to lead. Did you know that? Wives, did you know that? Huh? Some men won't lead properly. Because I've heard it said more, than, uh, more often than, than I care to remember. Oh, well, I don't want to go straighten these things out of my house because if I do, I'm just going to create a war. Well, you need to go create yourself a war. You know, you need to go let the thing manifest for what it is. It's time for you to lay down the law. It's time for you to set things in order. Set your house in order because, you know, it's like the prophet said to Hezekiah, set your house in order because you're about ready to die. And the bottom line of it is, the first thing you're going to give an account for is how your house is. So, back to it. This beautiful thing. The Lord, made, the Lord made the woman for the man. Ooh. Can you hear him screaming now? God made the woman for the man. God did not make the man for the woman. The woman comes and completes the man. <laughs> like she completes creation. God made the woman for the man. Can you begin to comprehend that? Oh, well, if he loved me, he would care more about me. He would do more stuff. For God made the woman for the man. He made someone to help him. He made someone to bring to pass all of those things that he divinely purposed the man to do. So the woman, by virtue that he made the woman Eve to complete Adam so that he could fulfill all the things that God had purposed and commissioned him to do. <laughs> I, I, I can feel the fight. This isn't maybe God's word. This isn't my opinion of God's word. This is God's word. <laughs> the woman's identity is supposed to be fully merged with her husband. Listen, women, if you're not willing to say of the man, I respect you, I honor you, I empower you fully to lead me what you're doing every, is exactly what I want to be doing. Your call is my call. Your purpose is my purpose. I mean, Ruth had enough love for Naomi to say that to another woman, just a mama figure. <laughs> now, if there's really love and it's supposed to be biblical love, because I talk to people like this like in the marriage counseling room, I say, you know, this is really very, very simple. I'll say to the man, do you want to follow Jesus and do the will of the Father and be, those, be that person that God's called you to be and Christ Jesus created you to be? Yes. I look at the woman, I say, do you want to do the will of the Father? Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to be the person that Christ Jesus created you to be? Oh, yes. Well, we got it. It's good now. We're done. So now, because you're both willing to do that, you're both, oh, you're, it's not about either one of your wills now. It's about the Father's will. It's not about either one of you living or pursuing your own purposes in life. You want to follow Jesus? We're done. And guess what? God's going to give you special insight. He's going to speak directly to you through your husband. He, he might even prophesy, not even know he's prophesying. Just like when Caiaphas prophesied. Is it not expedient that one man should die for us, then a whole nation perish? He did not know, but even though he had that rebellious priest was condemning Christ Jesus, the only Son of God was prophesying. <laughs> Because as he said in an office, there was an anointing to do so, an anointing to lead, an anointing to be the head. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to tell you, we just tell the Lord, 
You know, when we say, you know, the Lord says, just acknowledge, acknowledge me in all your ways. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge me in all your ways and I'll direct your path. <laughs> we act like that we can do that, that we can acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways. And not lean to our own understanding, but look to him to guide us. And that somehow he's going to fail to do what he promised to do. No, he's gonna, he's, you don't find yourself... I, am, I find myself here tonight doing exactly what God ordained me to do. To lift up my voice and be what God ordained me to be. <laughs> and, you know, he gives us the ability. No matter what people think, no matter what people say. Then everybody gets to voluntarily decide whether they're going to submit to such a program, to such a divine action of God's grace. And then they say, come to church. Well, they come to church so they decide that I don't know what I'm talking about. Or whatever that is they decide. Huh? And I'm going to tell you right now, people, are, people live under diverse weights and measures. People take all kinds of wrong things and wrong directions from the world and from their bosses and from their unsaved parents even. You listen to me. Huh? And they go on with a commitment to obey and love and uphold the relationship. But as soon as they get in the context of the kingdom of God, huh? now all of a sudden we're finding out what real obedience and what real love is and what real commitment is. Are you listening to me? Because it really comes right down to the same kind of situation that a woman faces with her husband. And I know this. If a woman is rebellious against her husband, she has that same rebellious spirit inside of the midst of the church, and it is leaven. And we say, oh God, send you fire. You fast and pray till you die. Nothing's changing till the wrong behavior, till the rebellion is put to death. And it can only be put to death by the blood of Jesus Christ in true repentance. That's it. You can't have rebellion and disobedience and defiance in one area and not have it in another. And the fact of it is, if you really examine yourself, who is it that you are in submission to? I know a lot of women, this is going to hurt you now over there coming on the East Coast. I know a lot of women go to a church where a woman's a pastor because the only person they want to be in submission to is a woman. Because they're man haters. They don't say they're man haters, but men have disappointed them, men have let them down, men have hurt them, rejected them, and as a result, they don't like men. And they had an angry dad. An angry husband, and that's all they can see when the pastor's crying out saying, Repent! By the power of the Holy Ghost, all they see is an angry daddy. Or an angry husband. Right? That thing needs to be broken. I don't think you can make heaven with that. Well, the Lord assures me, you can't make heaven with that. And so what do we do? We pray, we cry out, we intercede. Father, there's so many people blinded to what Satan is doing. See, deception's only really good when you can't see it. Deception only... And, huh, and that's why we got to... That's why we just walk in love and we walk in submission and we walk in humility because it's protection so long as we're just willing to say, okay, r- rule over me. Tell me what to do. I'm here. Huh? And, and just haven't you seen me over the past 30 years telling people to do a bunch of ridiculous stuff? All I've asked people to do is smile and get happy in the meeting. All I've ever asked people and got excited about is people to live right and bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus. <laughs> All I've ever asked people and got upset about is the frowns and the disappointments and the discouragements because it is a manifestation of an evil spirit. It isn't just some kind of, of events that has made people unhappy. It's an influence of a demon power that is set against the church and set against God and set against any light of His presence being revealed in the earth. It begins right in the relationships at home. And mom and dad... What you are spiritually at home, if you're not walking in God's divine order, you recreate it in your kids. Huh? As much as you recreate them and they look like you, and you know, most of the time you see a, a baby, you look, you say, man, they're the, a baby's perfect blend of both of you. A baby's gonna be a perfect blend of both of you in every way, and especially spiritually. 
I don't have to. I don't, <laughs> no one's got to tell me what's going on in the house behind closed doors. You can see it manifest in the kids. People, come on. We need to lay down our life for this. this. The, the only way we're going to raise up these children that God ordained us to bring forth. Holy Ghost filled kids who love God and hate evil. Holy Ghost filled kids who know how to yield to the Holy Ghost and resist the demon spirits. As if we have the proper relationship, the one that God designed, the one that He ordered, is probably, as far as I am concerned, from a biblical point of view, it is the most singular, important thing to God about how we live and interact with Him than anything else. That's why, you know, Peter said, right there in the context of, in fact, 1 Peter 3, 6, right there in the context of uh, he, uh, Peter saying, well, Sarah called Abraham Lord. You, bet you need to act just like her, right? And then he says, and, and husbands, uh, give honor to your wife as unto the weaker vessel. Well, see, when, when Christ Jesus brought us into relationship with him, he gave us a new name. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and he then in giving us that new name, he conferred his glory on us. Whew. His glory, his, his beauty, his, his glory, his purpose, his identity, what he's doing, what he's going to do. Oh, he's conferred an inheritance of all his riches, of all that he'll ever have and all that's been given to him. I, he gave it to us. What love. What love. Huh? We can get up and tell him he ain't doing it right. Well, we just disagree with him. Huh? We're not going to do that and create an argument. <laughs> are we? Are you? Maybe you are. I'm not. I'm just so happy to be here. Love just makes us so happy to be here. We just so happy about everything because we get to be here. That's love. The appreciation of love. Somebody uh, recently responded to the first Order of the House series. And they said, I don't know if I ever want to get married. If I have to give up my identity, if I have to give up my careers and my goals, forget about it. Get real. I'm being very real. And it is very challenging for women who are career-minded women. Our culture, by design, not God's design, a demonic design demands that both parents go to work and abandon the house and abandon the chief, most singular, important thing in the mission of husband and wife. Children. And the kids are just standing there with big old wide eyes waiting for dad to come home, right? Mom's there. And then as soon as dad walks in the door, they're all so excited about dad coming home. Mom goes at it. And the kids are going. And they can't see because they're so consumed with their own self-interest. The kids are melting before them as they watch their parents go at that demonic realm of strife and anger and violence and everything that is evil. My God. You can't raise prophets like that. You can't raise people who know how to walk in the spirit and refuse demon spirits in such an atmosphere. Oh, it's all my husband's fault. Oh, it's all my wife's fault. The latter might work. The, for, the former certainly can't. Huh? Didn't work for Adam. Lord, it's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. Didn't work for him. Huh? My wife said, if Adam would have been the man of God he was supposed to have been, he'd have gone slapped that fruit out of her hand. He'd have stepped up. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, baby, I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> now I got some partnership. We can diffuse a little bit of this. Now I don't want to diffuse it. I'm happy to stand with God. I'm happy to stand on the Lord's side. I'm happy to stand here being partners with him. Hallelujah. <laughs> People say, well, my husband wasn't such an idiot. That's ridiculous. That's like the church saying, if my husband wasn't such an idiot. Because women submit to their husband even as they do to the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, what if you don't have a husband? Well, you need to make sure that your dad, you, you, there's, hopefully you got a Holy Ghost-filled dad. What if you don't have a Holy Ghost-filled dad? 
Well, hopefully you got a Holy Ghost filled pastor. Huh? And, the, and your pastor is not like Hophni and Phineas. This pastor is not like Hophni and Phineas. Huh? And we, all we're going to tell you to do is walk with God. All we're going to do is point out where things are going on in your life that aren't right with God. You get around me in every place that you have an open ear to hear Satan, it's going to go off. As soon as you get around me, you're going to hear him. Because Satan hates the anointing and immediately start accusing the anointing. And the hotter things get, the more radical I come at the demonic, the louder he's going to speak in your ear against the anointing. Because Satan is set to destroy the anointing. You can see it in the day. If you can't see it before, you can see it in Adam right there. We came to destroy it there with Moses. We can go down the list with Jesus. Kill him. Kill the, the, the man child before he has time to be able to do anything. Huh? So as soon as it's brought to birth, as soon as it's born, Satan sits there ready to devour it. Huh? Satan wants to destroy every order of God. Every divine order, every divine principle, every way of God, Satan has set himself to destroy it. And you know, in your handouts, I underlined something there in, the, um, in that second paragraph under the first heading, number one. I underlined and emboldened something there because it's so important to emphasize that when you consider that the woman derives her glory from the man even as the man derives his glory from Christ. We must all pause and consider the glory and honor that is conferred upon the subjects of a divine relationship. Said, you can't, you, the guy I married, I thought he was, you know, Prince Charming before we got married, but my goodness, he's, 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 he's this... Scarecrow, Wizard of Oz. No, 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 no. That's just a lie of hell. It's just a demonic power of darkness working against the relationship. As soon as you begin to honor him, a glory is conferred upon you because it's God's divine order. As soon as I honor Christ Jesus and I come to him, a glory is conferred upon me. I may think I have it all put together. I may think that I'm all right, everything's good, and I'm well on my way, and I'm well equipped. But as soon as I step into the light of his presence, I recognize how empty, how, how, how wrong I am, how I'm living everything opposite of what God intended me to live. And I call upon him, and I honor him, and I put my trust in him, and immediately he works a miracle, confers his glory upon me. So most women have never come into the glory that God wanted to come confer upon them because they never came into the order of the divine relationship. That's why people look at this verse of Scripture and go, what? What? <clears throat> Nobody's supposed to glory in His presence. There's the only glory that's supposed to be is His glory and His image. And so Paul unveils some things that are pretty radical there. Huh? He so said, man must not cover his head. Because Christ is his glory and, and we don't want to dishonor our head. Only his glory can be revealed. But the woman, she's the glory of the man. She should be covered. Now I've watched a lot of people put a burqa and veil over top of their head. They're more religious and rebellious than the ones that don't have one. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Huh? God's talking about submission for first and foremost. A, a meek and a quiet spirit. Humility, brokenness, that kind of love, that kind of honor, that kind of respect for the divine order. Listen... Listen, Mary could have never redeemed mankind, ever. Only a man, only a man, and that man being God, Christ Jesus, could redeem mankind because man is singularly responsible for all of humanity. He is singularly responsible for his family. Because of Adam's transgression and sin, because he was singularly responsible, not Eve, not Eve. You can read this in, in um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Not Eve. She wasn't responsible for all of mankind. She was deceived. It was, it was Adam who was in the transgression. He was singularly responsible and because of his sin, 
All humanity came under the bond of that iniquity because it's man that God will hold responsible. My, my wife is going to be held responsible for my house. I am. It, 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 not only, listen, the responsibility falls upon the leadership. You think that you can just be all right and allow things to be out of order in your home? And you're going to be okay with your wife because you don't want to create a war. Meanwhile, you're defying and even defiling the order of God. Step up. Step up. I recently said to a person, I said, you will not dishonor or disrespect your husband anymore. We're done with it. After slamming the door and leaving him five times, six times, saying, I want a divorce. So you will not disrespect or dishonor your husband anymore. So not the first woman I said this to. And as soon as I did it, enraged, she drove off and left. I'm done. If I have to honor, if I have to give up my career. No, no I didn't even ask her to do that. I didn't even get to that point. I didn't even get to that level yet. We're just taking one step at a time. To start off just showing some respect. Quit telling your husband that he's full of a demon when he's got the anointing of God upon him. You know what I'm saying? And that goes on in more religious homes than you can imagine. Huh? Well, we just supposed to, we, somebody said, well, you're just supposed to uh, lay your life down for that. That's nonsense. Jesus didn't lay his life down so sin would continue. He laid his life down so sin would be cut off. That's nonsense. Oh, you don't want to get divorced. I'm telling you, agreeing with rebellion and walking away from the divine call of God upon your life is, is far, far worse than divorce. I mean, that's just religion taking a hold of people, gripping them with a strong hold so that they can't break free. I've watched it over and again. I've seen some people when I've said that, they've repented. But for a while, they never really understood how to resist devil, demon spirits. They repented for my sake. They never really realized, wait a minute, I'm under the influence of oppressing, oppression, of an influence of a, of a demon power that is doing this because the, the, the ultimate goal is to have this same attitude in every home so that no child will understand what it means to walk in God's governorship. Yeah. Because there's more training spiritually about how to yield to the Holy Ghost taking place in the interaction with mom and dad than there is in the teaching in Sunday school or any place else. I hope you can hear this tonight. I'm after this same man. I'm at war. Can you tell I'm at war? <laughs> yes. I'll tell you right now. I've had to cast out some devils here tonight. I cast them out with the word. Huh? And by, by the line, if I keep preaching before long, all the voices will shut down. Now what happens? God gives us discernment to actually hear the voices where they're speaking and who's under the influence of, of them. And then sometimes he just doesn't let us tell them. Just, no, just leave them alone. Just leave them alone. Because where I, reality of it is when you get your heart right with God, you won't hear those voices anymore. Huh? So if you kind of mean say, is it me hearing the voices? I might tell you, yeah. If the Lord released me to tell you, yeah, you're hearing voices, you know you're hearing voices, you hear his accusations. You know, it, it, you're, when, you, when you're right with God, your heart burns when the word of God's going forth. When you're not right with God, you are resisting it. You're resisting the word that's going forth. It's real simple to discern. Huh? Do not our hearts burn within us? Huh? huh? Their heart was right with God. They'd given all the follow Jesus. We watch people all the time resisting the anointing because they resist the word. They don't understand what's being said. And many times it's because it's hitting them right square in, in, in between the eyes with respect to where Satan has an advantage in their life and will ultimately take them out and destroy them in hell if they don't get it. And so excuse me while I scream while your house is on fire. Are you listening to me? Excuse me while I scream while your house is burning down around you. <laughs> I never forget the Lord gave me a dream. And in this dream, uh, it was, you know, often received dreams from the Lord. In this dream, this house is on fire. And I was standing on the outside and I could look up in the window and I could see people I knew. People, people that were actually 
in my church at the time. His church is my church. My church is his church, so you hope you understand. And I'm saying, your house on fire, get out of there quickly. They, would just, they, looked at me, they looked out the window and they looked at me like I was ridiculous. They gave me that ridiculous look. Huh? Or they gave me that bowed head look. Like they're not paying attention, don't want to listen. Huh? Which if it was one of my children, I'd take them into the room and spank them. Huh? So the Lord said, if you can't rule your own house, how can you rule the house of God? Well, I ruin my own house. And my children to this day will obey me, whatever I say, as adults. I'm going to rule the house of God. It's just I don't have as many tools. I don't think. No, I do. It's just not by, it's just not by the arm of flesh. Huh? Papa takes care of it. Papa takes up the slack. Huh? He defends me. I stand in his place. He defends you, husbands, because you stand in his place. Huh? And, and wife, if you, are, if, you, if you do well and you suffer for it and you take it patiently, you know what the Lord says? He said, this is, this is thankworthy. He said, this is, the kind, this is the kind of lifestyle I've been looking for. And your father will take good care of you. He'll sort his anointed out. Hallelujah. He'll straighten your leadership out. But if you get your hand in it, you start trying to straighten them out, I'm tell you, all you're going to do is make it worse. So let me just finish reading this because of what's underlined. God created man to walk with him in a glorious relationship of oneness. And likewise, God created the woman from the man, ordaining that they should be as one in purpose and life. And if you don't believe that that's Bible, then let me just help you understand it from the perspective of your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are supposed to have no more identity of yourself. And I think that that's a big part of the problem too. People haven't stepped into the faith. They still have their own identity. I have the identity of Christ. So if I'm surfing, if I'm playing golf, if I'm in the pulpit, if I'm sleeping in the bed, if I'm walking around in my boxers, wherever I'm at, I got the identity of Christ. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Hallelujah. My hair is messed up and I look like, you know, Mickey Mouse because I got some kind of crazy hairdo. I got the identity of Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Huh? Huh? Come on, can't you just get a little bit more excited about that? You need to get more excited about it. And the more real it becomes to you, the more excited you become. And you don't have to take that as an insult. You could take that as a challenge and say, my God, I'm going to get right. You know what I'm saying? Because it's true. It's, tr it's just truth. The more these things are real to you, the more excited you are about them. I'm telling you, your money in your bank is real to you. That's why you're excited about it or depressed. <laughs> Whichever the case may be. Based upon the total numbers. Thank you, Lord Jesus. See, this relationship is not subjugation. A wife being in submission to her husband and reverencing her husband. You have to ask yourself, wife, have you ever reverenced your husband? I mean, honestly, my wife called me the perfect man when I, as far as I'm concerned, before this thing from was the baby man. You know what I'm saying? I was the baby man. And so she called me the perfect man. She was my, she's always been my campaign man. Has anybody ever heard my wife say any bad thing about me? Never. Anybody? Has anybody ever heard my wife say anything bad about anybody? Never. I mean, why not? She's your pastor. Why not? Why, why not follow her? You know what? I watch demon spirits come in and out of here. And they, uh, the, Satan hates her and hates that kind of lifestyle and hates that kind of divine order. And so they'll point a finger and find every accusation they can find. Huh? Let me tell you something scary. And I don't say this lightly because it is not in my department. But one night a man walked up. He was in the meeting. He walked up and he said, you messed up the meeting tonight. And he said something bad about my wife. Just, just a little disrespectful. And I had this great peace come over me. I said nothing. Within a month, the, the person had advanced cancer all through the body. From nowhere to advanced cancer. You get around the anointing. My dear friend, who they call the apostle of the assemblies of God in Argentina, Pedro Ibarra, he said, the anointing will kill you. 
And he had that in, his, in, the, he had that in the forward of the book that he did for Claudia Fredson. And uh, the publisher said, no, you've got to take that out because nobody understands it. No, no, the anointing will kill you. You get around the anointing and you start messing with the anointing. You think you can come and give your judgments in it. You begin to try to steady the ark because you think it's a little out of balance. Boom, you're dead. You lie about the finances. You lie about what you're giving to the Lord. Boom, you're dead. Huh? I'm going after a, a singular move of God where the Holy Ghost has so much control over the place that if God's judgments is in the house. I want his Holy Ghost conviction to be in you. In you you, you want to just understand what my prayer life's like. Oh, God, let your Holy Ghost conviction paralyze the people with fear of you. So that falling down, they repent. Cry out. You listen. They should spend eternity in hell. Lest your church should go on being profaned in the earth. And what I know... So important to that is that my house is right, my house is in order. Uh-huh. That I set no evil thing before my eyes. Uh-huh. That I honor my wife and I keep my relationship with her, as Paul said, in sanctification and honor. Uh-huh. We keep it in a purity in the realms of holiness. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. Because we know that what's going on in the house ultimately will impact the church. You can't have it wrong in the house and have it right in the church. That's religion. Uh-huh. Outside you look good, but on the inside you're full of every vile thing, right? That's inside the house. Inside the house you messed up. Uh-huh. You come to church and you want to you try to look good. You can come to church, but just get down on your knees and repent and stand there and look, try to look good. Because Papa sees what's going on, Pastor sees what's going on, and anybody who has spiritual insight also sees it. Huh? This doesn't do me. Dear people, there is a realm of glory that I desperate want to, desperately want to step into, but there is a realm of glory that I have stepped into. There is a realm of glory that I'm desperate for you to step into. So that, so that it will be on you, the countenance, the glory of, of, of it will be on you. Father wants to confer that glory upon you. But you've got to come into a place where what he wants is all you want. Where, where he's leading is all, it's the only place you want to go. His purpose is the only thing that you want to know. And then he's hooked you up with a man because he that found a wife found a good thing. Because Father brought her to you, obtained favor from the Lord. Now, it's about you submitting. I heard not too long ago, I mean, I was in a situation where the parents of the, of, the, of the woman, they were so full of rebellion. They were demanding their daughter to rebel against her husband and tell her husband that he had to follow her. And she was so connected with her parents. See how it breeds? It had just continued to breed subject, generation after generation. And it metastasizes. In other words, it spreads. It's like a cancer. It's like a disease that spreads. And it gets its tentacles all the way out there. And there's some denominations that are filled with it. They're filled with it. There are some literally denominations, church denominations, that I can name right now. They are literally filled with subversive, rebellious, seditious things that manifest themselves fundamentally in women. True. Yeah. A- a- am I against women? No. Do I look like I'm against women? <laughs> I'm just telling you, this is what's going down. I- I'm-, I'm talking about it in the context of the church because I mean, men are full of just full, just many full of many just many devils. Men are men are full, filled with the pride of life in church. I'm just telling you about the order because remember the order. The first thing that Paul, that Paul addresses is wives, submit yourself. Be under the leadership of your husband as, un, as you are to the Lord. That's first. That's going to be first. And when you walked up to the altar and vowed, you vowed that. You vowed it before God. You vowed it in the covenant and now you want to backslide and blame it on your husband? Well, how can there ever be the divine order if it's just continual argument and strife and bickering and fussing 
and disgruntled, unhappy, don't like it, blaming God, because you're blaming husband. And reality of it is, is everything that you say to your husband, I'm talking about a godly relationship here, people, that this don't even fit outside of God, okay? This don't even fit outside the church, forget about it. Are you listening to me? I'm not talking about some, you know, guy who's living a life unholy, unclean. I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about godly relationships. So the, the understanding that that kind of nonsense that's going on totally keeps your husband from ever stepping in to a place of divine authority and being able to move in such a relationship with you that divine glory can be conferred upon you through your husband. Huh? And then you can ultimately complete him so that he can ultimately then fulfill his divine purpose and call in God because you're going with him. God did not make you women to compete with your husband and to search out and find your own life and own identity. He didn't. He said, I'm going to give you a new name. I want you to look at this in Isaiah chapter 62. I probably run out of time. Oh, check it out. My computer's back up and working. There we go. Yeah. I have. I'm just basically getting warmed up. Come on, people. Help me clear the atmosphere, will you? Huh? Will you? Huh? Will you? Will you break all affinity and allegiance to the powers of darkness and all influence of demon spirits start walking in the Holy Ghost? Come on now. Huh? We quit being suspicious and critical. We quit, will you? Being double minded. Come on now. Get after it. Walk in God. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Determined to see the kingdom of God advance in the earth. See change, first and foremost, come into your life. You know how I present myself to the Lord? Here's how I present myself to the Lord. I don't present myself to the Lord. Oh, Lord, change them. I present myself to the Lord. Lord, change me in every area of my life so that it's fully in complete total submission cooperation with you. See if there be any wicked way in me, O oh God, lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, here I am. I submit myself to you. Now, Father, I go immediately into this. Now, Father, use me as a sharp threshing instrument that hath teeth. Oh, God, use me, O oh Lord, as a sharp sickle in your kingdom. I'm telling you, I would, I, I, we want a harvest, but we got to understand that the, the, the container has got to be right for the harvest. The, the harvest has to come in to his floor, to his threshing floor. Huh? Not to, not to something that's just religious. I want, God, wants a, God wants a Holy Ghost-filled house. That, that's a revival house. It's a Holy Ghost-filled house. It's a place filled with all of his shouts and praise and love and goodness. It's where everybody's connected, where every person is submitted. <laughs> and if you were raised in a house of rebellion, understand right now the thing is on you. You is an assignment against you generationally. And just because you were born again doesn't mean that assignment's going to get cut off. It's going to get cut off because you're going to learn how to do what's right. You're going to obey God. Huh? And you start hearing things going off in your head uh, of accusations against your husband. You fall down on your knees and you repent. You don't start taking it out on him. You fall down on your knees and you repent. You're sitting in the meeting and you hear accusations going against the ministry. You fall down on your knees and you cry out. Are you going to disturb me? Oh, God, forgive me. Father, I'm so sorry that my spiritual life is such that my ears are wide open to what the devil would say in your holy house. Do stuff like that. You'll be in a move of God. Are you with me? Because it's all revealed in heaven. There ain't nothing, there ain't no secrets, there ain't no hiding. It's all a floodlight of heavens on this thing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. You want women, wives, do you want to get it? You want to understand it? It isn't hard. Look at what the church is to Jesus and be that to your husband. Huh? Men, you want to get it? Look at what Jesus is to the church. And be that to your wives. Women, you have, to, you have to empower your husband to step into that realm by first and foremost doing what God told you to do. Recognizing that you were made for your husband. Your husband wasn't made for you. 
Well, you need to take care of my needs. Can you just hear the church? Jesus, you need to take care of my needs. If you love me, you take care of me. That is craziness. That's rebellion. That's not truth. If you love me, you don't really love us. You don't. We can tell. <laughs> you would never, we would never do that. Would we have a church service and the pastor leads out the church service? Lord Jesus, we know you do not love us. You would not come back to that church. That is demonic. You'd say, that's demonic. Well, then why do you do it to your husband? Because you are effectively doing it to Jesus. That's what he said. And if you've never repented for it, you got sin against you. You spotted. You listen to me. You better repent. Not silently. Huh? Uh-huh. You, you confess your faults to one another. Huh? Well, when you first started, you couldn't go back and confess to everybody. You know, my goodness gracious, you couldn't run them all down. And you got to go find everybody you ever did anything wrong against before you could get saved. No, you, get, you call upon the name of the Lord and he breaks off the yoke, frees you, creates a new creation. But after you saved, you start doing people wrong, you got to go tell them, look, I did you wrong. Forgive me. Huh? That's what the Lord says. You bring an altar up here. And you have to remember that there's something going on between you and your brother. You go get it right with them. Then you come back and I'll take, I'll receive your offering. And that's why then Peter says, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, lest your prayers be hindered. Giving honor to the weaker vessel. Huh. And then people really hate it when you get over there in 1st and 2nd Timothy chapter 2. And the scripture says, women learn in silence. Huh? And really what I believe that is means learn without arguing. Huh? I really believe, don't, don't try, don't do that which is illegal and demand something from your husband. That's usurping authority. Hmm? Well, boy, they, they're calling 911 right now. <laughs> what do you mean I can't express my opinion? Well, let's put it in this context. Does it, does, it, does it work within the framework of the church expressing their opinion to Jesus? Huh? Now, remember, you go back. If you really want to understand the context of what I'm saying, you have to go back and review the first order in the house. Because I believe in the strong leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is a leadership through servitude model. There's no dictators going on here. There's nobody being treated as the inferior. It's just you've got to understand God's divine order. God did not create man from the woman. Now, God creates... A, 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 I don't want to use the word equality because we've got to be careful with it. Many theologians would use the word equality. God creates an equality between the man and the woman and says it, that, you know... It, when it, comes to, when it comes to being in Christ Jesus and walking in the Holy Ghost, there's neither bond nor free, no, right? Nor male, neither male nor female. And, um, and I wrote that scripture down here for you. It's, and I'm trying to stop. And I, I believe it's in the second paragraph there. This is the third paragraph. Galatians 3.26. The Lord's made us heirs together. 1 Peter 3, 7, heirs together of the grace of life. Hallelujah. He's poured out the Holy Ghost upon both male and female, sons and daughters. Praise the Lord. But at the same time, he's done the same thing for us with him. That's why, that's why, that's why I'm careful with the word equality. He's brought unity and it's unity that does bring a, a certain degree of, it brings total oneness. It brings oneness. But he's still God. He's still leader. He's still head. Amen.